So here's something I talk to a lot of people about in health when we talk about gamification and, and health and <laughs> fit, fit, and whatnot, is this issue of our persona identification. So not everyone's motivated by the same thing. Some people are competitive, some people are social, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, how do you identify the right persona so that you can then communicate to them in a way that's effective to motivate them because they're motivated? So when you look at the research on personality, uh, identifies what they call the five factors. Also, there's five factors. There's your goal orientation. Now, I can tell you, based upon your goal orientation, what personality type you have. So, they say the four goal orientations are a learning orientation, a competitive orientation, a kind of a, a competence orientation, and then a, a work avoiding. How you communicate a message to someone depending on their goal orientation to try to get them to do more steps, right? So if they're learning orientation, you say, did you know that taking more steps can make you healthy? Click here and learn about it. is they're much focused on persona and customizing or messaging within the game based upon persona identification. There didn't used to be, but now because there's more people gaming and because we can identify some of it, there's a lot more focus on that. It's hard, even with the data that we mine, to get down to the persona level, you know, of saying, hey, uh, we have five women playing, each of these five is this type of persona, we're going to give them a different message. It's more about, hey, our game is being played by women 25 to 45 that on average exhibit these traits and this type of, per and we you know, build a profile and then cater the messages to that profile. It's, it's a narrower, like through a tutorial to say, depending on what buttons you click, we're gonna put you in this bucket, and what buttons you click, we're gonna put you in this bucket, and you know, maybe there's some behavioral analysis we could do that way. Because uh, I know in games we've done things like that, especially with getting someone into a game, just by watching them and consciously set up these choices so that we can start dividing them into buckets. Because with a lot of these health-related, uh, games that we're focused on. You know, we're, we're trying to change behavior. Yep. Physical behavior. Right? Not just the way you play the game. And so you really don't get Hey, how you doing? How is the age? So how is the age? Oh, okay. So I was just waiting for them to bring dessert before we had you start. All right, so we just did that? Yeah. I want to hear it. You're the only one then. Oh no, oh no. I have problems with expectations. We're going to be bringing in our dessert in just a minute, but I thought we'd, we'd get started here with uh, Jeff Peters. Jeff Peters uh, actually has been involved in health gaming before there was such a thing as health gaming. Uh, so he actually you could almost argue is the grandfather of games for health. Okay? And he doesn't look that old, right? Like, he has no gray hair, it looks like. He's missing hair like I, I am. Missing. But, but, I uh, used to have long hair and a ponytail at this point. Right, so uh, I actually had a beard for a long time. And my beard was to cover up the fact that I lost hair on top of it. I cut that out. Uh, and so what I've asked Jeff to do is to, to do several things, actually. One is I've asked him to give us a perspective on how the whole idea of health gaming has evolved over time. Uh, where, uh, you know, it, it started out as kind of science projects to see whether or not health gaming could that make a difference in people's health by connecting it with, with uh, digital games and media. Um, and now he'll tell us that some of the largest gaming companies in the world are expecting half of their revenues to come from health games. Okay, so, so they're actually significantly moving in this health gaming direction, so they don't view it as a science project anymore. They view it as a core business for the future.
Okay. I've also asked him to share because he's a guy that can't keep a job. So, so he's, he's changed his job many times like me. I'm on my fifth or sixth career right now. But uh, I've asked him to, to give a perspective on how you actually turn these game ideas into businesses and into games that, that can become successful and, and profitable. And he's doing a lot of that work right now in his current life. Uh, as well as help us understand you know, what are the challenges to health games um, and then what are the value and the benefits to that. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you and you can go through your presentation and then we've got, I know lots of questions. We've been having a, an entire discussion group going on over here about uh, all the challenges in health gaming. But if I could introduce, uh, let you introduce yourself some more, but... Uh, no, you've, you've done fine. <laughs> Hi, everyone. All right, let me... And if you need a picture... Yep, it's right here. I was just coming back to get it. Welcome, everyone. Glad we could all get together on this beautiful day in Snowbird. Um, I won't be as exciting as skiing, but uh, for the next 30 minutes, hopefully we'll at least get across some some fun data points and talk about this wonderful subject of you know, what is games, what is gaming for health specifically. And I'm going to talk about four different things today. Um, Chris did a wonderful job setting the stage, but what the heck is a game for health? Um, some of my personal historical view of some products that I worked on in the past and how that relates today. Challenges and opportunities now and, and frankly trying to finish up with what is, what's the business here? Um, things I won't talk about is how to gamify something. Um, marketing and awareness, production methodologies, those are all big enough subjects within themselves, so we'll try and focus on these things for today and um, see how much we can fit into the next 30 minutes. So what the heck is a game for help? And I'm, sh I'm sure everyone in here has either a personal definition or a working definition. Um, I've seen a lot of things floating around, and I want to try and work through this through some examples of, you know, what's out there in terms of entertainment already. You know, starting with, um, does just putting a health meter in a game signify this is a game for health by itself? Uh, which seems kind of simple, but it, you know, it, it is a, a health uh, a tactic. Um, if we look at the history of video games, um, as Business Insider tells us, that games are often portrayed as antisocial, violent, and an addictive waste of time that encourages obesity. <laughs> not, not a very promising view of the world's dominant form of entertainment right now. Um, to date myself a bit, um, going back to the 80s when the concept of arcades was a big thing, um, video games were considered the death of civilization as we know it. It was the forefront of bringing drugs into society, ruining our kids' lives. Parents would band together to keep arcades from coming into the neighborhood. I mean, you name it, everything bad was, was put against it. And somehow as an industry, we've survived since then. Um, to contrast that, uh, American psychologist says playing video games, including violent shooter games, may boost children's learning, health, and social skills, which sounds very positive now. That's cool. Um, but does that, if you believe that, does that by itself now make every video game a game for health because we have these now positive benefits? So I think in looking at these competing views to attempt to have a sort of a successful definition or a litmus test or something that, all right, we can put games up against and say, is this a game for health or is this something for entertainment? And be able to use, use that as a, as a working um, mantra, if you will. So some other examples. Um, looking at what's currently available on the market. Uh, World of Warcraft, here in the upper left. Um, I'd call a lifestyle game. Um, some of the people spend more time playing World of Warcraft than actually living in reality anymore. I'm not sure that's a healthy endeavor. Um, Starcraft 2 in the lower left represents eSports. And the amount of time and effort we have people spending in eSports, 12, 14 hours a day, being antisocial, trying to get good at a game, is that a healthy way to spend your time? Granted, there's the promise of something you know, cool at the end of it. Um, in the center at the bottom, Call of Duty or Battlefield or any of these first-person shooters, the best to find is killing simulators, which I think is the opposite of any concept of a game for health. Um, one of my favorites at the top here, the Surgeon Simulator. If any of you have played it, um, it's the concept of trying to do surgery with, with a hand like this that you're floating around. and. Um, more entertaining than anything else. And I think in the screenshot, he's trying to pour orange soda into the body cavity there. <laughs> yeah, um, more entertainment value than educational value from that. Um, to contrast those, we have a nice calorie tracker, which is productive, 
provides data, is definitely focused on health, but also isn't very fun, um, as most data repositories really are. Um, so maybe the answer is somewhere between these things. And in trying to come up with something, um, I think most people in this room have probably seen something to the effect of this, gaming to change behaviors for the positive, in terms of what is a game for health, um, which sounds really good. And the question is, um, can we get even more focused on this in order to help figure out some big problems? Like, can we make dieting fun, um, checking blood sugar levels fun? Um, can you make feeling fit fun? Well, Nintendo's already proved that we can do that, the amount of money they made from it, and most of their future is gonna be focused on it, so I say yes. Uh, but one of the things I've looked at is, what is that, that litmus test? What is something a bit more specific that might help separate entertainment from games for health? And this is kind of where, where I've ended up at the moment. A tangible, substantive, and measurable game consciously designed to change life for the better. With key things in here being measurable, game, consciously designed, so there's no, you're not getting an accidental benefit, you're actually going into it with something that you intend to do, um, and then it's changing a life behavior from the better. And if we kind of look at a more specific definition like that, the previous examples that I just put up and showed, frankly don't fit this. And which I think is a good thing because it helps us to narrow the difference between pure entertainment and what is frankly a game focused on health and health benefits. Um, and to help us figure out business models and such. Um, perhaps it's a good starting point that we can build off of. And to now use that um, as a context to go back in time a little bit. So I actually came to Utah, 91, 92 era from Southern California. And I came here specifically to make video games. Um, it just so happens that the first video game that I made here in Utah was a game for health and health benefits. Um, we didn't call it that at the time, but that's what it ended up being. Um, and there were actually a couple ones that we were doing. The company was called Sculptured Software. And this company ended up being one of the top 10 developers uh, in the early 90s, making games like Mortal Kombat, NBA Jam, Super Star Wars, um, the WWF games, and a bunch of other top titles that were really cool. Um, so this company also was looking at a, what then was a subgenre or a curiosity of can we make games that help make people's lives better? And to jump into those, so these are a couple that we worked on. Um, you gotta love the art. <laughs> Captain Novelin in the upper right and Rex Ronan. Uh, Captain Novelin was made by a friend of mine that sculptured software and a separate team. Rex Ronan was one that I spent a year of my life working on. Um, and I'll get to what these games were in a minute. And we also dabbled a little bit in exercise equipment and can we gamify running on a treadmill and such. Um, but I'll, I'll get to those in a little bit as well. So first is the lovely Captain Novelin. Um, am I blocking your view, Chris? No. Oh, still, okay. Um, so this game was designed specifically for kids to teach them about managing their diabetes and managing their blood sugar levels, their glucose levels, and in order to gamify that wonderfully upbeat subject, uh, this guy here, Captain Novelin, of course, a superhero, um, his job was to run around the city, a platform style game, and rid it of all of the bad stuff. The sugars, the sweets, the evil donuts, the, the horrific boxes of sugar-based cereal with too many carbs. Um, and at the end of the level, depending on how many bad guys you got rid of, you would then have the opportunity to check your blood glucose level, decide how much insulin dose to give yourself based as a result, and between that loop, learn, hey, how do I live a healthy lifestyle? Um, I would try to not destroy the broccoli guys and the protein guys, but really get rid of you know, all the sweets and stuff. Um, I want to read, just because I think this is fun, a review of this game that came out at that time. Um, this is an actual review. Um, at a glance, Captain Novelin, one of the best known and most embarrassing failures of the Super Nintendo age, <laughs> appears at first glance to be merely a crappy platformer. But no, this isn't just any old crappy platformer. It's a crappy platformer about diabetes. But let's face it, diabetes is nowhere near as tragic as the fact that someone out there was so desperate for game ideas that he decided to base a side-scroller on an incurable disease that makes your pancreas shrivel up and fall into your underpants. I love this, this is gold. Um, 
the gaming community wasn't quite ready for games that had a social benefit, if you will. Um, and so gamers kind of rebelled, but that, that was an actual review of the game at the time. Um, I'll get to results of the game. Did it work? Did it not? In just a minute. Um, moving on, we'll talk about the next one here. Uh, Rex Ronin, Experimental Surgeon. Um, this also was picking a big subject and trying to gamify it, and the fact that this was a game about teaching kids about the dangers of smoking and learning about all of these dangers and, you know, not to pick up and never smoke. Um, you were Dr. Rex Ronan, as this wonderful prose helps state. Jake started smoking when he was 15, but now he's dying from smoking the cigarettes he once sold. Jake's only hope is Dr. Rex Ronan, a brilliant experimental surgeon. Dr. Ronan will shrink himself down to near microscopic size and enter Jake's body to fight Jake's diseases. <coughs> Pure Shakespeare. Um, so what you would do, this is, this is Dr. Ronan, and we sent him through the body following the path of smoke and smoking diseases through the body. You would enter through the mouth and teeth, and you would end up in the throat and the trachea and uh, eventually make your way from the lungs all the way up into the brain, getting rid of tar and nicotine and residue and destroying cancer cells and such. Um, along the way, the evil tobacco companies didn't want you to succeed and expose the dangers of smoking, so they put all these little microbots enemies to thwart your path into the body as well, so you had to fight them every once in a while. So you were fighting evil tobacco then. Um, in order to help teach the concepts, um, every once in a while you would get these, these smart bombs that would show up. And in order to activate them, you would shoot them and it would pop up a question. And this question would be a fact or something about smoking. And it was a true-false question. If you answered true, the smart bomb would blow up and kill all the bad guys. If you answered false, bad things would happen. So aside from you know, the combination of visually showing you what's going on, as well as giving you context and questions, that was sort of the teaching loop and hoping the kids would actually understand what's going on with that. Um, I had to work with child psychologists, the American Lung Association, American Cancer Association, the grant funding group on this. Getting them all to agree um, was not fun. Uh, we put the fun in the game, not outside of the game. Um, and it took about a year to actually make this at a time when the average game was taking four to six months. So this actually was a, ended up being a pretty big endeavor. Um, but like I mentioned with Captain Novelin, the world didn't really care about this type of stuff at the time um, because it was focused on social consciousness and frankly, it wasn't Mortal Kombat. So hey, we're gonna ignore it. Um, looking at the business model of this, which I think is important for comparison to, to other stuff to talk about later. Um, technology, Super Nintendo, so it was a cartridge-based game, so we had to manage inventory and do manufacturing. Um, only manufactured about 5,000 units because that was the minimum Nintendo would apply, uh, allow at the time. Um, distribution, retail and wholesale, because that was the only real options for a cartridge-based game, physical goods thing. Um, and there was always talk about optional sales to go directly into doctor's office, uh, pediatricians, YMCA, boys and girls clubs, et cetera, et cetera. I don't believe any of that happened. Um, the funding was very simple. Um, Raya Systems, who was the company that went out and got the grants, they brought us government grants, and as long as we made the product that cost less than what the grant money was, everybody made a profit, and that was the end of it. Um, there weren't too many other outlets to, even though there was some opportunities, these never went anywhere and they couldn't sell any. Um, so it was actually a very narrow business model based on what was going on at the time and what the opportunities were. Um, and frankly, one of the, the concepts to understand is at this point in time, so back in the early 90s, everyone playing games were gamers. Um, a very narrow group that, okay, if you didn't like fighting games and blowing stuff up, okay, you didn't play video games. Um, and so gamers really didn't care about this stuff either at the time. Um, we also played a little bit with, as I mentioned, exercise equipment. And um, although the ideas were noble and have come to fruition 20 years later, the concept of putting screens on an exercise bike or on a treadmill, uh, we didn't have GPS systems, uh, the LCD screens, the colors weren't cost effective, and the whole thing just kind of fizzled away, I guess. Couldn't make much of it. Um, and moving from those things, um, opportunities and challenges now. So 20 years have passed since those wonderful experiments, which it, it doesn't represent the entire industry that was going on, but I think at least is a, a good cross-section of the types of things that were happening at the time. Um, and so to move forward now, we will look at some boring charts and numbers. Sorry. Um, so total video game market. So video games are taking over the world. Um, 
based on the fact that we all play games, and I'll touch on that a little bit more, this seems like a good thing. Um, video games uh, this year are projected to earn about $111 billion worldwide. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a fun number. By comparison, um, I have numbers from 2012, so the film industry grossed about $35 billion, whereas in 2012 video games were $79 billion, so almost double at that point in time. And although for anyone that's following film, you know that the film grosses haven't exactly been growing over the last few years, whereas video games continue to skyrocket, we continue to see exponential growth. So everything about video games is still a growth industry. Um, looking at the hours spent gaming is looking at 2011, the average gamer spent five and a half hours a week. Um, 2013, it was six and a half hours and growing. I don't have 14 or 15 numbers, but just to give an idea of the amount of time that we're spending with video games also continues to grow year over year, which also justifies why we're spending more because we're playing more games, we're digesting it more. And another really interesting thing that's happening is we're not focused on one dominant console or platform anymore. Go back 10, 15, 20 years and it was, well, I'm a Sega player, I'm a Nintendo player, I only play on Sony stuff. Um, and that's not the case anymore. In fact, even with the latest iteration of PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, I find fewer and fewer people that claim to be a Microsoft player or a Sony player, they talk about the game they play that just happens to be on a different console. And now what we're seeing is a steady growth of people that are not focused on a console, but are playing across everything. So this is a quick chart about gamers and time increased of playing console, PC, plus mobile and platform. <laughs> and up until 2013, we see a constant growth where half their time is now being spent on other platforms. So we have this, this sort of vision of, I'm playing games everywhere. And because these things are now portable, I can literally play them everywhere. The, the living room is no longer a constraint or a limitation. Um, portability, um, I think, is another thing not to be underestimated because if you can take your entertainment with you, that changes all of the rules. Um, Netflix, I think, is a good example of here is a service that you can get anywhere and actually, um, as consumers, we're lazy and demanding enough to actually expect that. Whatever I open up, whether it's a console, a PC, a laptop, a phone, I expect Netflix to be there and I can continue watching my movie. I think we're getting the same with entertainment and video games and the way we digest it, and thus we're seeing you know, players no longer focused on one dominant platform, but actually moving between an entire ecosystem of electronics. Um, and one area that's, that's exploding um, to focus on is the concept of wearables, which I know everyone in this room has probably talked about in some way, shape, or form. Um, and to add to the, the boring chart segment, um, for those that can't read it, this is 2014 and projected 2015 of inventory, of selling units uh, in terms of wearables, which include smartphones, smart watches, not smart phones, excuse me, smart watches and health and fitness trackers and devices. So 17 million units in 2014, up to 51 million units in 2015. That's a threefold growth in one year. Now granted, Apple's releasing the iWatch this year, so clearly that's going to be a big deal, especially with Apple projecting that that's going to be a, a billion dollar revenue stream for them anyway, once it gets going. Another way to look at the same thing is, we're right here, 2015 in this chart, and this is an example of units being sold, projected between now and 2019, and what we see is a projection of a threefold growth in all wearables in the next three to four years as well. So every, everybody is gangbusters on growth here. Um, and then lastly, you know, looking in terms of revenue in billions of what the wearable market has been doing and where it's going. So, you know, looking at 2011, 630 million, it doubles in 2012 to 1.2 billion, doubles again in 2013, doubles again in 2014, and we're still growing, or at least as all the projections and such. Um, with this year projections around, you know, $7 billion just for the wearable industry alone. Um, and that's in addition to the revenue of video games, because this isn't considered video game revenue. These are all hard products. So I watch Google Glass, Medical Tech, Health Bands, e-textiles all fit within this, this growth category, which to me create opportunities for what health-based gaming can be, other ways that we can get information, track data, et cetera. Um, all right, we're done with charts. On to gamers. So, 
20 years ago, gamers ruled the world. Anyone that bought or played a video game, or frankly who made a video game, was a hardcore gamer. There, there wasn't this concept of demographics, there wasn't this concept of um, uh, even different genders playing games. It was mostly a male-dominated business back then. And you come forward, our industry is now 43 years old, uh, if you look at, you know, with the advent of Pong in 1972, which is enough time for there to be multiple generations. So the kids that were playing games in the 70s have, have grown up, they've had kids, and their kids have had kids. So now we have, everybody has grown up with video games, so we have our parents and grandparents now playing video games as well, which is a cool thing. And all that simply means is we've gone from in the last 20 years of gamers as a market to everyone, which is pretty cool. Um, because now we're able to do a lot more specific things than we were able to do before, which is understand a core demographic, to understand that, hey, Candy Crush is played by 40-year-old females, um, to make a littlest pet shop game that targets eight to, or five to eight-year-old little girls, things like that that we could never do before, that there never was an interest. Um, plus with this, another benefit is with all these generations <laughs> growing up playing games, there's no fear of touching tablets. There's no fear of touching a video game or a controller. It, it's ubiquitous. We all know it, and there's no fear. So it's easy to get people into it. They're not afraid of it. Like, I look at my parents, for example, and my dad's still afraid to touch a computer. No matter how much I try and convince him otherwise, he still won't touch it. We don't have that problem anymore with everyone else that has now grown up through that era and has grown up as gamers, which also creates more opportunity and less of a problem to sell people on, well, why am I playing a game, or, what is, or I've gamified this thing, I don't understand it. Um, I think that fear is gone, which opens up more opportunities. Um, Let's see. Um, the business side. So now that everybody's a gamer, um, and the market is still growing in this space, um, what are the opportunities, what do you can do with it? Um, and especially, what is the op business opportunity for a health-based game? And I kind of look at it as an order of operation or a series of questions as well. So the first thing is, who is your audience? Um, Every health-based game is going to have a problem to solve. You know, what is the core thing I'm trying to teach, learn, prove, help out with? And then who's going to play it and who's going to pay for it? So just thinking not necessarily from the creative side, but from the business side. Because who's going to play it and who's going to pay it might be two completely different people. Um, in the case of Rex Ronin, um, government money paid for it. The consumer, um, the children with diabetes, were never going to give us a dime for the thing. Uh, whereas, compare that to, say, Nintendo's Wii Fit, where the consumer uh, and the customer were the exact same person. Recognizing that will also help you with the business model and understanding, uh, which I'll get to in a few minutes, of you know, what are all the different types of business models we can use and how to maximize that. Thinking in terms of genres, because I've been making video games forever, it feels like, and always think in terms of genres first-person shooter, um, is it a strategy game, is it a role-playing game? Well, I think in looking at games for health, you also have genres in here to focus on, which also help define the business model, the customer, um, the demographics, all that type of stuff. So I think back when um, I worked on my little experiments, um, we could put them into two buckets, education and personal improvement. Um, in fact, today, we fit, could probably fit in personal improvement. The Rex Ronin game fits squarely in education. Uh, but I think coming forward a little bit, we now have a couple of other things that we can add to it in terms of rehab or therapy or maintenance and being able to gamify these experiences. And I think I'll, I'll get more later on as to types of things that exist in each of these buckets. But one of the things that I think is um, fun to look at and understand is all of the technical changes that have happened in the last 20 years that have frankly opened up new opportunities that didn't exist before. Um, everything's digital now. So the concept of inventory management is a choice. Whereas it didn't used to be. Your only option was inventory management. And if you couldn't sell everything, then you obviously killed all of your profits. It's wonderful that now everything can be digital. Um, portability, being able to have basically a computer in your pocket that can be games, it can be status tracking, um, is absolutely wonderful. Um, development environments have now opened up. Whereas previously you would create your own game engine, you would create your own technology. Now with open source environments, whether it's Cocos 2D, whether it's Unreal, whether it's Unity, um, you've got options. And in fact, many of these you can start developing for free now. You don't have to develop your own. Um, agnostic software. And what I mean by that is 
you make one product and it now works across all devices. Um, you don't wanna have to, as a consumer, think, oh, well this only works on my Apple, this only works on my Xbox One. The power comes from, oh, here's this one product and I can actually play it on anything that I own and we're almost there. We're like this close. Um, cheap game engines, which I've already mentioned, which give a, a um, very quick way to get into it, reduce tech costs. So it used to be, whether it was a Sony PlayStation or a Super Nintendo or pick the gaming console of your choice, there was always a lot of money spent in hardware, spent in buying development kits, spent in buying massive expensive software, and most of those costs are now done. Anybody can make an app, a game, a product, a program in your basement or in your bedroom um, as long as you have an internet connection and can download stuff, um, which has reduced the barrier of, barrier of entry for so many people. Cloud storage has allowed us different ways to store data, track telemetry, understand our consumer better, uh, which didn't exist previously, and of course, new tech. I mean, just the, the wearables market and where that's going um, is pretty cool. Um, and to focus on wearables again for just one moment, this is a very ugly screen that makes my eyes bleed, but I, I think it highlights a couple of interesting things. One is, these were all the players in the wearables market in 2012. So I've looked for a chart to try and put everything together for like last year. It's been hard to come by because there's so many new players, but if you look at this and think, wow, I can't read all these names and it's only grown, that's scary. Scary cool. And of course, Apple's made their big bet on it and you know, all the sorts of different devices that are you know, wearables. And a couple of cool things that I think about the wearables market being mass market, which it is and it's becoming more and more now, is mass market brings the cost down. So the more and more people these buy these, the more cost effective these devices are gonna be, the more fully featured they're gonna be. Just like you know, these phones. When we look at five, six years ago, we were all using feature phones with 100 by 100 pixel black and white screens, and now we have computers in our pocket that rival you know, a PlayStation 2 moving up to an Xbox 360 in power. Um, how quickly things change. So the price and features and availability is gonna get more amazing, and more importantly, Consumers are showing that they're willing to buy these and use them, which means they're not afraid of them. Because when you think about new technology, normally you have this fear, this barrier of entry. And with the amount of people buying these things, well, everybody's already wearing smart watches and they're wearing Fitbit stuff. Um, my wife uses Fitbit and she uses it to monitor her sleeping, which creeps me out completely. Um, I know I don't sleep well and I could use more sleep, but I don't need an expensive uh, item and software to tell me that. But anyway, so some people love it and they're not afraid of it. Um, this concept of technology is becoming ubiquitous, and um, although my parents won't use it yet, um, all of the rest of us uh, clearly will. So I think that helps the business model. Um, and then in addition to that, when you look at the high players that are getting into this, whether it's Apple, Samsung, Fitbit, Nike, Nintendo, I mean, these are big names, big players, big bucks behind it um, with big initiatives going behind it. So this isn't somebody dabbling in a new business or a new industry either. Um, on to business models. So looking back, um, again, at the products I mentioned I did 20 years ago, it seemed like these were the only things that were available if you wanted to make a health, fitness, games for health type product, um, with some of these being more viable than others. So based on the limitations of technology and funding and retail and selling, VCs and angel investors didn't want to go anywhere near it, even though it was, you know, it was an option. They didn't want to touch it. Most corporations couldn't figure out how to make a profit with it. Same with nonprofit, even though they would fit in that bucket. Um, and really all you ended up with, or at least we can figure out, is you know, government funding. Okay, we're trying to prove a concept, trying to do something new to prove that it worked. Um, and you know, potentially direct to consumer. I think those are the viable things. Um, I will say, uh, I forgot if I mentioned it before, but both Captain Nobelin and Rex Ronan, the cool thing about both those products is they worked. In our testing, and our studies, we did afterwards, uh, kids got better with their diabetes and insulin programs, and you know, the education and the before and after surveys were great for the anti-smoking thing. So at least we showed, hey, there's something here that can work, that can change behavior. Um, so anyway, so 20 years ago, I think small opportunities. And when you look at where we are today, because of technology and all the other reasons we've talked about, there's more opportunities available to look at how to fund these things, how to sell them, how to get money, um, more opportunities for our consumers as well. So like now, especially when you look at the explosion of wearables market, if I'm a VC or angel investor, I can look at all that data and go, wow, how do I jump on board this thing now? 
um, and knowing that Nintendo has proved that, okay, I can play a game with the goal or the promise of being healthy. Lumosity has proven that there's a business model there. And you know, with the wearables and the promise of a healthy lifestyle, there's clearly something there to branch onto. Um, excuse me. So in terms of like consumer-based business models, free to play is now dominating the game space, which is clearly also a way that we can sell and monetize these games. Or a premium download, where okay, I'm heading directly to the consumer and there's one price. Ad sponsored, which could be you know, a single corporate sponsored, or it could just be out there you know, in terms of public based on how many users you have that day. Um, health insurance, healthcare funded, I think become two more viable options just because of the adoption rate and because Everybody play games, they expect it. And with the wearables thing, I, I, don't know. I think these are viable options now to go after. And the last one that also didn't exist 20 years ago is this concept of crowdsourced funding. Um, I have this great idea, I'm gonna ignore VCs, I'm gonna ignore angel investors, I'm not gonna give my company away, I'm gonna go directly to the consumers that I think would be interested in this thing and I'm gonna ask them for money. Um, I think this is really cool. When you look at the success models of this over the last four years, there's some wonderful success stories. And I haven't seen too many in the crowdsourced area yet focused on health. I've seen a couple of interactive watches and a few other what I would call wearable things, but what we're talking about today I don't think has been tested into this market yet, whether it be Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or other. Um, so I think that helps open the business model, frankly, wider open. Moving back to genres to wrap things up here. So just trying to throw out some examples here of what can we see in each of these, these four genres that I threw out there? I think personal improvement is probably the easiest one for people to see. You know, products like um, you know, We Fit, uh, Lumosity, um, uh, what we can now do, I, I can actually in my living room ride the Tour de, Tour de France with screens, with telemetry, with the bike going up and down following the hills. That's pretty cool if you, if you like punishment. Um, but it works, right? Um, education, I think also pretty easy to see. Whether it's helping kids to learn about complex subjects, oh, my parents have cancer, what does that mean? You know, turn that into a game to help it be easier to digest and to understand the concept. Or what's happening to me, what's his own personal development? Um, we already have a lot of early development programs and stuff for kids. Um, LeapFrog has been doing some great stuff there of just you know, early development, quick learning, um, uh, training, medical procedures, lifestyle professions, healthcare skills, even serious games fits into this. Uh, concept is most serious games tend to focus on you know education or teaching something as well. Um, maintenance, um, outpatient service, check-ins, drug taking regimens, um, disease management, I think all fit in this category. And you know to be able to have something that makes this what is going to be a, a grueling process be more in entertaining and engaging. Granted gamifying something doesn't take away the gravity of the situation but at least help someone you may get engaged and maybe take your mind off it for a while. Plus, I think you have a better chance of people actually following the regimen. Um, uh, remission, I think, is a great example of that. Um, looking at the participants, and for those that don't know, remission is a game designed to help kids, it's kids specifically, right? Um, maintaining their, you know, their cancer regimen and such. And in this current study, participants were given remission and maintained higher levels of chemotherapy in their blood, took antibiotics more consistently, and in the control group demonstrated the game's impact at a much higher biological level. Um, current results suggest that a carefully designed video game can actually have a positive impact on health behavior on young people with a chronic illness. Um, I think that's a great case study for more products in this same genre and um, same type. And lastly, rehab therapy, treatment, um, in terms of goal setting, reminders and achievements, if I have to rehab my shoulder, uh, if I'm doing exercise regimens, um, or even disease treatment, I think fits into this. Um, one of the products I spent a lot of time working with is the Tetris franchise, and got to learn about the Tetris effect and a lot of the positive health benefits that Tetris has um, uh, shown over the years. And one of the cooler things is this, whereas Tetris being used to help cure lazy eye, to be both more um, entertaining and to show the results far quicker. Um, and what they do is they use a VR uh, type setup where one eye is shown the grid and the other eye is shown the falling piece and the brain has to try and match the two. Um, which I think is really cool. But anyway, I think there's more opportunities there of looking at you know, what games can be used to help different um, uh, 
uh, rehab or disease treatment things. I think it's a very innovative approach, and there's more out there if we go looking for it. Where? Lastly, where does that leave us? Bless you. So I think looking at everything from the data to the evolution of who's gamers playing games, um, the wearables market, technology, I think there's opportunity here specifically to carve out a niche, a, a different type of genre, a different type of product in the video game space specifically. Um, it gets me excited, you know, looking at all this stuff, looking, okay, what can we do with this? Um, you know, the last one we just talked about, you know, using Tetris to help cure lazy, I think it's really stinking cool and innovative. We need more of that stuff. Um, I think there's opportunity here, but it's, it's not gonna be easy because trying to do something new is never easy. Innovation is fun, but that's also never easy. Um, personally, I've always enjoyed the challenge of trying to create something new, and I think that's where we are right now. Gamifying a tough subject is also hard, but coming up with um, positive and negative feedback mechanisms, reward mechanisms, um, strategy systems, upgrading and character development, um, adding fun, I think all of that is a fun creative challenge unto itself, especially when you have a, a specific goal you're trying to go out there and get. And I think we all know that um, if you make a game out of something, people are more likely to be engaged, they're more likely to follow, they're more likely to do it. And when it comes to health, I think actually doing it is probably the single most important part, which I think summarizes why, why to marry the two concepts. And that's what I got. That's it. Hopefully that is informative and helps a little bit. I'd like to open it up for, for questions that people might have. And the first one I'd like to ask is you mentioned to me earlier, although I don't uh, didn't hear it recently, okay. that uh, Nintendo was talking about trying to move half of their business towards uh, health. Yeah, they've, they're typically very secluded when it comes to what their future looking policies are. But last year, they did leak quite a few things that, based on the success of Wii Fit and Brain Age and Big Brain Academy and all the stuff focused on health, um, I mean, um, Brain Age specifically um, is a cool case study because they targeted senior citizens mm -hmm. and targeted places where they go to get them to play a game, mm -hmm. and it worked for them. Um, but yes, they've let leak that you know half of their future is going to be focused on fitness. Mm -hmm. Have they released the specifics, the details, the sense of what it is? I haven't seen it, but know that okay, that's they're gestating on that. And just last week, they also announced that they have a new gaming console in development. Of course, they won't talk about the features. Do those two mix? Do they not? Don't know. Um, but that's unfortunately all the data I have in Nintendo at the moment. Other, would you say they're, they're, an, they're going for it. Would you say they're an outlier, or would you say they're kind of a trend of what we would expect from other gaming companies? Um, I think other big gaming companies, you know, Electronic Arts and Ubisoft and Activision, are probably going to wait and see, because most of those companies are based on wait for someone else to create a market, and then we'll jump in. Um, EA, for example, has tried to do a couple of products in the fitness area, and it didn't work out for them. Whereas Nintendo, it worked out, you know, fantastic. So, you know, I think they're having more of a wait and see. Um, I think the people that will spend more money and spend more time in here are going to be independent developers, frankly, folks that have nothing to lose, that can go for it and be innovative, or the folks that aren't traditional video game manufacturers that will be looking at, okay, how do we combine our products, like Nike? and have been reading about the division they've been staffing up to do more apps and products and programs to fit with all of their wearables and stuff. Um, that's probably where we're gonna see more of that stuff originate. Yes? With all the um, development of health things, where do you foresee the evidence being embedded into that product to refer people back to what the basis, you know, the knowledge that was the basis at that time? And how can we update that health information as it changes without having to redo a whole game? I, um, so is your question, if we put a game out there that has a health benefit, we've seeded it with a bunch of info, how do we change that info if that changes outside of the game? Right, and how do you document what evidence you did use at the time to create the game? Well, one of the, one of the things that you know, we do now in gaming is, and we, we were just talking about this um, a little bit ago, is this concept that every game that we make is less about, hey, it's going to take me eight hours to finish it, and more about, this is a live service that I expect someone to build into their lifestyle and make almost a hobby. And with that strategy, it also means that we have a lot of servers controlling the data on the back end. So if we need to change something, 
we can either change it on the server side or put out an update or a patch or something. So that's how we would manage the information if it changed. As far as um, tracking it, did it work or did it not, I think one, it comes into, in starting the project, I see you know, every game in this field starting with a problem statement. What are we trying to help? What are we trying to cur cure? What are we trying to solve? And coming up with a series of questions. You know, if, we, you know, if the user sees this, will he do X? Will he do Y? Will he do Z? Um, another thing that has become very common with games these days is tracking all of the data. Everything that happens. Every button click, every screen, the amount of time you spend in the game, where you go. Um, we're trying to figure out how you think. And so with that, we would use the series of those questions from the problem statement combined with our telemetry on the back end to figure out is this having an impact or not. Um, you can also follow up with some more brick and mortar ways of surveys out to the people using it or question them and stuff. But um, you know, it, the, the thing I found most about telemetry systems is you succeed or fail based on your initial questions and your report generation. So if you can nail those up front of what you really want to get out of it, then you have a good chance of solving exactly what you're describing. Yes? So one of the questions I have, you sort of address it with the older games. Uh -huh. We're trying to balance sort of fun and learning something. Right. Do you have any other you know, specific suggestions about how to do that in new games and apps that might be developed to make that balance? And, and if you had an ear on one side or the other, what do you suggest we do? Should it be more of a a fun piece of the So I think if you go fun, you never go wrong. I mean, we're all looking for escapes, right? That's why we have movies and TVs and video games for that matter. And if you can make it entertaining, in many cases, that concept of I'm getting a health benefit actually diminishes and you forget about it because you're having fun. If you're having fun, it's more likely to be part of your lifestyle. Um, it's more likely to be part of your daily regimen and routine. You're likely to come back to it. We're likely to invite friends to do it as well. So for, as far as I'm concerned, when in doubt, make it fun. And how to, how to gamify something, how to use all these techniques of game theory and stuff, that's many, many hours of conversation, probably more than we have time for today, of what is it. Because that path would also be different based on the problem you're solving, the type of genre, the type of demographic and person you're going for, and what types of games and game mechanics would. I, I don't know if I answered your question. Is that I come close? Well, I, I, yes. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of specifics to, right. to it, obviously. Right, that's a big question you were asked. <laughs> yes. So, WeFit had high sales before we impact. I'm sorry, say that again? We sales, we, we fit, uh -huh. had high sales but low impact. It's just like um, the research showed that most people don't use WeFit more than, I don't know, it's like a month or something like that. Just like, just like an exercise bike. Just like that. Yep. So then Hope Funny Lab, how that fits. I know. Hope Lab had a very small audience, 9 to 13 year olds with cancer, but very high impact, mm -hmm. um, very successful. So why is it that we haven't, you know, this is a, um, a part of gaming that has been around for a decade or long, or two decades, as you quoted, quoted earlier. Why haven't we seen any real blockbusters? that have come out that we can all point at and say that this is the success story? I think one of the biggest problems has been the business model, getting people to dabble in it. Um, because there hasn't been a lot of justification in order for people to spend lots and lots of money to go after this market, or even prove that it's there. So it's actually been more of a grassroots market that's frankly tried to grow, if you will. Um, I think Nintendo was probably one of the biggest catalysts from it, of doing something different and getting paid for it. Um, one of the issues, I, a couple of issues I personally see with Wii Fit is one, it sold a promise that it didn't deliver, which is, hey, if I play this game, I'm going to lose weight and get healthy. But the act of doing it didn't increase your cardio enough. It didn't do all the physical stuff that would deliver it. And it stopped being fun after a very short amount of time. It was a very shallow experience. So to me, it, it sold a promise that people bought into, but it didn't deliver on that promise. Um, and I think if you can go one step further and deliver on it, now you've you, you've got something more. Do you think probably DDR is probably the best example of something out there that they DDR is a great fitness game. Yes. Uh, they didn't promise it. Right? No, they didn't. Yeah. It's an accidental outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and especially if you're playing the big physical arcade one where you've got to bounce around and you can work it and you can be harder than the plastic mats you have at home. Oh, yeah, that's a great workout. And you have fun doing it. Yes? So how do you see, like, bad games, is it fun dies off, even if you're doing it mathematical, how do you see, because if we're looking at a five-year habit and the game's only 
fun for a year, or even a little bit longer than what you mentioned. Like, how do you see games developing to make fun longer? So I, I think that's touching on something that has been hard to recreate for any game. Um, I mean, just now, in the last, I'd say, three to four years, have really, as a video game industry, we focused on a game that lasts two years, that lasts three years, that is live and people are still playing it. That's, that's an anomaly. Most games historically were, I buy it, and it, frankly, it used to be, I buy it, I play it for two hours, I never finish it, and I move on to the next game. They were all disposable media. Um, so we've gone from that average two-hour play pattern, excuse me, to people developing a two or three year relationship with Farmville, or Sims Free to Play, um, or even Angry Birds, or Bejeweled. And so I think it's touching the new design realm specifically. So I don't think that's a games for health problem. I think that's a video game industry problem that is trying to be cracked as we all sit here and talk about it. And there are some strategies that have shown how to work, like one is frequent updates, making sure the game is not static every month, every two months, something, introduce something new to keep the ecosystem going. And that's shown to help work so that people start to get, look forward to, oh, well, next month they're going to give me something else I'm looking forward to. Yeah, back in the back. Um, when we were talking about WeFit and VR, I just sort of wondered if it had anything to do with subtlety in terms of, like, people don't think it's cool to do something that's good for your health. Uh, could very well be. When, when I did Rex Ronan, and nobody thought it was cool. I took a lot of ridicule for even agreeing to do the project. Um, but I think there's still some of that stigma of, you know, in, in fact, even if you look at the foods you eat, um, it used to be anything healthy was considered bad. Well, I'm not touching it. That's healthy. It's got to taste bad. And there was this, this philosophy of, well, health equals bad tasting. Why would I order it in a restaurant? Why would I buy it? Why would I make it? So I think you've got the same sort of carryover into this space as well. But I think we're starting to see a change with, again, Nintendo's obviously had some success, which has shown others as a market here. And you know all of the wearables and smartwatches and Fitbits of the world, you know, now jumping into the deep end in this thing with lots of money behind it, right? that has the ability collectively to kind of change the, the attitude of it. Plus, I think if, we're, if I'm taking a macro view of looking at society in general, um, we have Subway that is now based its entire reason for living on health food. Um, and we're starting to see you know, uh, gluten-free you know, items on restaurants, um, vegan stuff there, and we're starting to see more, I think, of a health-conscious society, so I think that helps. I have no data to back it up, but just, again, trying to take a step back. Well, I guess just a quick follow-up question. I yeah. wondered like, if it works to your advantage to sort of hide the fact that you're trying to get something healthy. Um, it might. I look at the demographic. Um, who are the people you're targeting, and are they, where are they in their evolution of being either accepting or in denial? Like, for example, if we were doing something to target a hardcore gaming audience, you know, 18 to 30, I would absolutely hide it. I would bury it as much as possible and then let them know of a happy accident. Yeah. You have. Um, do you have an idea that you, for a health game that you wish people would make? Great question. Um, I'll come back to that. I don't, have, I don't have one off the top of my head, but great question. Yeah. Uh, similar to the um, Tetris game uh -huh. and to Rats Run, do you feel like there's an appetite in the market for these, like targeting specific populations with health games, or is it more based on just overall health and wellness? I think you'd probably look at the type of product you want to make and get more specific that way. Um, I don't know if a shotgun blast across the bow is something that's going to work. I mean, even Nintendo with Wii Fit was targeting a very specific female audience and a very specific um, age range. Um, uh, but basically, it was the stay-at-home mom that you know wasn't getting out, wasn't doing anything. You think that okay, let's give you a fun way to give you the perception of staying in health. And so they, they targeted a very narrow audience. Um, I think the same would be true of these types of things, especially creating a game around it. Is we now have the opportunity to not do shotgun blasts, to understand the market, to understand the persona that people are going after, and the better you can understand the habits. You know, all of us in this room are on somebody's demographic list, if you will. Um, probably a better chance to succeed, or at least better chance of designing a game for that uh, demographic as well. Yeah? How do you see revenue models being generated and things like that where they're so niche that the patient's not going to pay for it, you know, the physician is going to pay for it, and health insurance companies aren't going to reimburse it yet. It's so needed for an app. So getting funding for something narrow is indeed a challenge. 
Um, the options I see end up being ends up being you know cost per item or cost per unit. Um, if it really is a very narrow demographic, um, it could be it's a way for a pharmaceutical company to frankly push their wares. It's part of somebody's regimen. So can you get them to pay for it? Because can basically convincing this app, this product, is going to get your core and target audience playing. You're going to see better results from it. Therefore, you'll have this, this compulsion loop, if you will, of, oh, more people play it, they get better. It sounds better. I get to sell more of these things. And so the game actually ends up being a sales tool as well as helping the patient if he wins. Um, if it's a, let's say it's something for breast cancer, and there's not one specific thing, that might be going up to crowdsourcing. You know, the number of people and organizations in this country that are specifically focused on breast cancer research uh, and health and repair, um, you know, maybe that's a way to go, af go after that market directly for something that, hey, if I play this, that would be the promise, I get a benefit somehow, either in my regimen or my meds or um, preventive maintenance. I don't, I don't know what the game would be, but just trying to make it a different business model that might work. Um, and then, of course, you've got corporations, and um, I think going after healthcare and having something be recognized that could be covered by insurance would be really cool. I've seen nothing test that yet. Um, but I think we're at the point now, especially with looking at pharmaceutical companies and the way they're able to advertise their own product on TV to people that can't go out and buy it themselves. I mean, a lot of stuff has changed to give them so much power that, all right, um, developing a product like this would be a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of money that pharmaceutical companies spend advertising. There is one example I can think there of, is. Of, uh, of a company that's doing that. It's called Almada Health. Mm -hmm. And they do, it's not really a game. <laughs> it's, a, it's an app okay. that's geared at diabetes prevention in the workplace environment. And they have specifically targeted, I actually interviewed for a job with them. They specifically targeted um, using the diabetes prevention program that was created back in 2001, and a whole bunch of research has been published on it. And uh, that is a certification process that happens through the NIH. And if you're certified, you can charge for it. Well, that's cool. And so um, if they're worth looking at if you're interested. They, they do a lot of uh, behavioral science in their design. It's not game. Right. So if you added a game component to it. It might be more. Right. It might give you better results, that's better right. benefits, and everybody wins. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, in looking at how we get people to create games for mental health, to improve mental health, which is why I'm here. Okay. Um, one of the things we looked at is, hey, all these kids are playing Minecraft. They're all yep. playing Sims games. So how do we get people to create mods for those? Um, can you talk to that as a market? <coughs> so the, the modding community, uh, which is mostly PC-based, um, usually starts out as a labor of love. You know, uh, a bunch of guys have a cool idea. They either love StarCraft II, or they love Gary's Mod, or TF2, or the Source Engine, or something like that. Like, hey, I got this great idea. Let's go mod this to do something more fun. And some great games have come out of that process. Um, knowing that, that, that they usually start as a passion project, somehow we have to convince these same people doing modders, doing mods that, OK, this is also a passion project. Um, I think it would be harder because most of the people that are out there doing mods are frankly hardcore gamers. And so, you know, like getting hardcore gamers to do a mod that would be focused on mental health, I'm trying to figure out in my mind, how do I sell that to elite someone interested? Um, the easiest answer, of course, money. You know, money solves a lot of things. Hey, these guys are very talented. If I can sell them on the concept and give them some money, I can get them to work on it. Now I've got a talent base working on an idea that I think will work. Um, money cures a lot of sense when it comes to development. Um, Can you define money as far as type, amount, frequency? Uh, um, well, if, <laughs> if you, to, to look at video games as a holistic business, um, a Battlefield game will cost about $100 million. Um, Grand Theft Auto is estimated, or the last one, to be about a $200 million production. Um, Many mobile games these days are in the 300,000 to a million dollar range um, before they launch and before they start doing their, their updates. Um, the modding community, if it starts off as a labor of love, usually invest sweat equity if they're passionate behind it. In fact, a lot of independent developers will invest sweat equity if they just believe in the thing. So if you get someone to believe in it, okay, maybe you can pull the money off the table or offer a revenue share on the back end. Hey, if you do this, Here's how I'm going to market it. You make the game, and we'll split the revenue. However, um, I don't think there's a fixed hard rule of 
how much to spend on a video game because the spectrum is just so huge right now. And in order for me to like sit here and say, okay, the, the mod for the mental health game that you're talking about, I would need X. We need to sit down and talk a little bit more about, well, what is the game? What's it intended to do? And get an idea of features and platform and game engine. And is it something that Microsoft would be interested in? I mean, they just put a lot of money into this block of money. Uh, mm -hmm. are, are they, if people came to them and said, look, we want to start with you, uh, a whole piece of this is happening. Uh, quite possibly. Microsoft is always looking for new businesses and they have money to spend on it. It's just a matter of convincing them, okay, is this the right thing? Um, they're putting a lot of money in augmented reality right now, for example. Um, whether it works or not, um, so far augmented reality hasn't amounted to much in terms of the mass market, but Microsoft's certainly investing a lot in it right now. Um, so that might be a place to think about and going with it as well. Um, with a big company like that, if it's something that piggybacks on an initiative they're already focused on, and you could show that there's a way that they will make either a, a better PR statement or, frankly, more money, okay, then you got a chance of getting them on board. But most, most big corporations are looking for, all right, how's this going to increase my bottom line? Anyone else? Yeah? What distribution or uh, area that you didn't touch on is employers? Uh -huh. Looking at this as a wellness uh, program, maybe a very reasonable wellness program if they can track and monitor the absentee and the health improvement of their employees. Got it. Do you see them being a uh, buyer? Well, it could be. So, for example, if you're um, if your workforce, okay, maybe there's something there that you could add to your already existing, you know, software library. It says, hey, okay, here's all the, the back end, and here's how you track everything. But you know what? Here's something that's that's fun. Your employees might have a better chance of using. Like, um, I, I picked on workforce because we adopted it in my last company, and you had a hard time of getting the employees to use it. Nobody wanted to touch it. It was cumbersome. It was clunky. I can go off on, on, on the reasons there, but if there was something more engaging, then we'd have a better chance of adoption from the workforce. So I think that would be viable to figure out, you know, what is that, what is that product and how does it help both the employer and the employee? Can I ask you that? Yeah. Um, there's a company called FixFit and they do a zombie game. It's all a corporate wellness game. And, uh, corporate and zombie makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> so what they found is actually Coca-Cola in the U.S. just um, took that game corporate so that they oh, cool. track. So they're trying to, so that's just one large example of a, of a company that's doing this. It. So it's, it, you, you get teams and it's to get people up and off there um, from sitting because now sitting is the new, new smoking. We all, we all need standing <laughs> desks. That's right. <laughs> and, and so they compete against each other with, with um, barometers and, and then they go in and they do stuff. You can die or you can come sure. into a, yeah. someone I know. That's but, very cool. That's glad to hear that someone is investing in that with, you know, with a very specific outcome. That's cool. I didn't know about that. Yeah, one of the things that we've been talking about and talking with my favorite librarian is that <laughs> as this market develops, uh -huh. we're going to find that at this game jam and this uh, competition and this published game, there were pieces that were really interesting, really good. The rest of it was crap, but, but, but those pieces were terrific. We had a way of capturing those and, and then being able to along he comes and he's going to do a great game. You can go find stuff right. and find the people who own those pieces. Has anybody ever done anything like that? Well, most game jams, especially the global game jam, everything that gets submitted ends up being public. So you can play all the outcomes from it. And many of the game jams that happen, whether it's the, the global game jam or by different independent groups, it, one of the goals is to make sure that you, the efforts of your labor for not sleeping for 48 hours is shown to the world so the other people can see it. Um, so I think it's out there. It's usually a matter of somebody investing the time to go and research and play all these things and find out what they are. Most game jams, especially the global game jam, will always start with a theme. So people have to design a game around that theme. Um, getting those themes to be more health related could be one catalyst to get people focusing more on those things. Um, another way is um, like the process things being used now uh, at the UU, which is getting some of the, uh, the students and the teams to focus on more health gaming stuff. Because one of the positive things, that's more of a longer term pay it forward, but at least you're getting the seeds in the student's mind. You're getting them excited about it and seeing what the benefits are. So now that it's already buzzing around in their head, they're going to come out and be thinking about it and have a better chance of maybe adopting one of these concepts in the market. Whereas all the old guys that have been in the, the industry for the past 20 or 30 years don't naturally think about that. They think about, oh, what's the next first person shooter where I can go kill people? 
Yeah. Um, so you mentioned like raising money and stuff, but my question is, how do you tell the story? Right? Because there's you know twenty six thousand health apps, right? But if I'm competing on the game side of it, there's what a million games. And so from like a if I'm trying to raise money, how do I tell the story? So that gets into marketing, PR, and awareness, and is the single biggest problem with video games today. Um, because with the number of apps, um, last stat I read, Apple was getting 5,000 new apps a week. There's no way for any human to digest that number, and let alone experience you know, a tenth of those things. But that's who you're competing with, is just sheer numbers with too many zeros. It's hard to get your head around. Um, so I think whether it's a health app or a video game, it's the same thing. And you're right, you have to come up with a story. That story is gonna be unique for your game and how you wanna market and promote it. Um, and the way I look at the, the way games have really evolved is the game itself is now the business. Whereas before, okay, you'd make a game, you put it on the disc and you'd sell it to Walmart and the business would take over and someone else would manage it and you already moved on to the next game. Now that we're making games that are lifestyle based, that are hobbies that you expect to spend years with, you make a game, you launch it, and you're going to keep working on it for the next couple of years. All the business systems, all the monetization systems are in the game, your telemetry analysis, whether it's ad-based or not, everything's in the game. Even your social networking stuff is in the game. Having said that, you've now got a separate problem over here, which is, okay, my game is now a cool business. If people knew about it, we'd all make money. How do we make people know about it? And that is the subject of massive amounts of articles and strategies and tips and innovations and things that is, is probably a bigger discussion than this afternoon on different ways and strategies to solve, but that, that is a big problem. Yes? Can you suggest some governmental roles? Sorry? Government role. Yes. That can contribute to support to growing this industry? Potentially, with the number of grants that have historically been there focused on science and health-related causes, trying to produce positive benefits and looking for new innovative ways to, frankly, help people. I mean, that's an easy way to look at the government's role as it is now. It also means going the grant circuit and everything that goes along with petitioning and getting government grants, which I've never done the whole process myself, but the people I know that have done it describe it as a very unfun and painful process. <laughs> but, but it is there. Right? Um, I think the other way the government could help, especially with all the changes in health insurance here in the US specifically, is how do you get these adopted as part of health insurance regimens? Um, uh, and you know, outside of the US, the different countries, with Germany, Canada, to get it adopted by the government there and part of their own you know, social things. I personally don't know that process. I'm curious about it, but haven't spent the time to figure out, okay, how would, how would I go make that happen? Yeah. Do you have an experience to make a game to educate children on the death? Yeah, I so, think it is not easy to make fun, make it fun. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, and no experience of trying to make um, uh, children understand the concept of death and stuff, which is a very heavy subject. Um, I think it's an interesting one because it's a subject that parents are afraid to talk to their kids about and afraid to be open and afraid how they're going to react to it. Um, I think it's an interesting problem to solve. In fact, there's probably some innovation that ends up coming as a result. I think that's a great problem statement. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be interesting to spend more time trying to figure out how to get the information across without completely depressing someone. Um, one of the things that strikes me with regard to this is that um, you don't sell a game, you sell a brand. And if you can sell a brand of the, you know, the, the group that's putting these things out is trusted. We have, a, we have a, an entry here that wants to do a franchise that might fit within a brand. Right. Their franchise is Smart Vegetables. So, okay. so the first one is Happy Tomato. You throw tomatoes in the stuff, and then the next will be some other vegetable. Um, can, can you talk to franchises and brands within um, that might apply here? But, so I think if you're looking at the, you know, the largest scale of video games right now, um, Electronic Arts or Activision, they only focus on brands. In fact, the most difficult thing for one of those companies to create is a new IP, a new intellectual property. Creating something from scratch, those companies aren't set up to do, and which is why you see so very few of them. Um, and they will take a brand and milk it for years and years and years until the GDC they decide it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> um, on the flip side of that, if you look at you know, brands of the provider, like Apple versus Amazon versus Google, 
um, and looking at video games that go across those three spectrums. Um, and I'm just going to talk about free-to-play games for a minute because um, I have the data off the top of my head. Let's say that you release a free-to-play game in iTunes. Um, the game earns, let's say, five cents. If you release it on Google Play, that same app will have an ARPU of about two cents or a penny and a half, um, unless there's some drastic things done to it. You release the same thing on the Amazon storefront or Kindle, your ARPU might be 10 cents. You're building that customer loyalty. Did, does that answer your question? We didn't take the risk of tomorrow. <laughs> Let's do one more question, then we'll, we'll let Dan have one. How do you think virtual reality headsets will affect the health gaming marketplace? Well, I think I already gave one example of a success in that, which is you know Tetris for Lazy Eye. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it takes a VR headset and two completely different screens in order to kind of make that process work. Um, I think when it comes to rehabilitation, um, whether it's PTSD and scenarios or hey, I need to get my arms working again. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there specifically that we historically didn't have. And with things like Oculus Rift, which is going to be a cheap VR solution, um, I think it's cost effective enough that you can start building towards it and create scenarios like at a, um, a phys physical therapy place. And maybe part of it is getting into a VR machine, whether it's a treadmill, a headset, and helping the rehab based on some additional experience than sitting there on a stool, lifting this thing over and over again, looking out the window, waiting for it to end. Have I reached 100 yet? Am I done yet? I'm bored. If it's something to take the board more, it might just be something positive as well. The boxing ring. There you go. Get ready for the something like that. Because, yeah, it's, I mean, I, I've had to do physical therapy, and bored out of my mind. I just wanted to end and go home. So if I had something driving me, some goal, or some other place that I could have my head be while I'm doing it, that would help. I'd be more, more engaged to go back and do it over and over again, too. Yeah. Well, give uh, Jeff a hand. He's All of you that are here have been invited to our workshop tomorrow morning from 9 to 12. And in that workshop, the objective of that is to actually try to solve some of the problems we discussed here today about how do you make all this happen. Uh, and we'll talk about the discovery process, the incubation process, the commercialization process as part of that as well. So keep all these thoughts in your heads as you go through the rest of the day. Come up with some ideas, and we'll share those ideas tomorrow through the workshop activities. All right? Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're done with this. You can kind of mingle and, and chat a bit. Um, I'll be taking a van of some folks back down to uh, their hotel here in a little bit, but otherwise we will see you all, most of you anyway, tomorrow at 9 o'clock at the business school. Okay? Okay. That's great.